I love Christmas time. Amen. Amen. Sure, you're out there. Uh, just a reminder: next week our service time is different. You get to sleep in a little bit, and we're meeting at ten o'clock. Both services together. There'll be no Bible class. We'll have one service in here, and Al and I will be bringing the lesson for you. And so we're excited about that. And so uh, 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 ten o'clock next week. Spread the word. We'll have it out on social media and in our web page and everything there too. So if you're listening online, why make sure you get that time change too, by the way. Henry Ford uh, was traveling, vacationing over in Ireland, and uh, this doesn't have anything to do with my sermon, but. Uh, uh, but uh, has this my kind of announcement type thing. Uh, he was traveling, vacation over in Ireland, and a guy that headed up an orphanage over there hit him up for a donation. They're trying to build a new building. So he wrote him out a check for $2,000, you know. And so the newspaper the next day uh, ran the story, but they accidentally ran that he gave $20,000. Well, the director of the orphanage went over to Mr. Ford, and he said, I, I apologize. I, I'll go contact them. I'll make that uh, right, you know. And he said... No, no, there's no need for that. He shrugged it off. He said, I'll take care of it. And he wrote him out another check for $18,000. I'm just saying, if you mess if up like that or whatever, we'll give you an opportunity to fix that too. <laughs> we call that the end of the year donation. Got it? So if you're looking what to do for the end of the year and maybe you hadn't written your check out as much as you'd like, Now's a good time, all right? So uh, we can, uh, uh, you can do that to a particular ministry. You can do it to children's ministry. You can do it to our, our, uh, our, our mission efforts. You can do it to whatever you would like to for our church family. Help fill the gap there, and we will uh, uh, use it, and the Lord will multiply it. Well, uh, glad you're here today. We've been in a series on grace, and I can't think of a better series to lead up to Christmas, which uh, Al and I will be talking about that great story of grace next week. But, uh, uh, you know, uh, even as we think about, we sing Joy to the World, we sing the songs, we retell the story of Christmas and the nativity scene and all those things. And, you know, the baby in the, the manger. And uh, uh, actually, I was watching, a, a Susan was showing me a little video on, uh, uh, on the computer of a of a story little kids were doing the uh, the Christmas story and one little girl came out and took baby Jesus out of the manger and the girl playing Mary was trying to take the baby away from her and they had this tug of war going have you seen that? <laughs> it's pretty it's pretty funny uh, but you never know what happens when you get kids on stage right uh, but the story gets retold but we've we've told the story so many times I think sometimes uh, it almost gets to where it's we only see the beauty of it. We don't see the mess. Today's title is called Messy Grace. Because in that story of Jesus, when he came to this earth and he was born, uh, if childbirth is anything, it's messy. Can I get an amen, women? And painful. That's why they call it labor, you know, right? And so, uh, and we sing peace on earth, but I'm not sure there was a lot of peaceful feeling going on at that moment. And a baby is messy. You've taken care of a baby lately? And they're not always silent night. I mean, it doesn't always work that way. Peace be still is not on their lips yet. They're saying some things. You don't know what it is, but you got the message. They want something, and you're trying to guess what it is, right? Now, that's good practice for your marriage because some of us run into that with our mates too, right? They're saying stuff, and we're trying to figure out what it is. So, but this thing of the birth of Christ, it's, it, it, it's a per there's nothing more perfect than, a, than that birth of a baby, right? Parents, you remember being at the hospital? I remember, I remember when, when Kristen was born, 
Uh, we had it all planned out. She's supposed to go in at a certain day because we were having the, the section done and that kind of thing. But it doesn't always work out that way. And all of a sudden, in the middle of the night, we're driving over to uh, St. Francis Hospital, and I miss the exit. You know, I got to take the next one. Luckily, it wasn't far off. And uh, uh, Susan was saying, that's okay, honey. Well, no, that's not exactly what she said. But anyway, we got there. And I'm waiting out there in the waiting room because I, I didn't get to go in with this first. I'm waiting, and, and all of a sudden that doctor brings out that beautiful little old red-headed girl. And then they take and they put her behind the glass, and I go and I look. And I, I mean, you know, uh, I, I was smiling. I was smiling. And I'm looking there, and then this couple, there's another baby there, and they're looking, and I thought, I felt so bad for them. That their baby was so ugly, and mine was so beautiful, you know, right? You know, that's how we all see. Because that newborn is perfect. It's perfect for us. And, and Jesus was the perfect one. And he came to this world to make us perfect too. But you see, in this life, this life is not perfect perfect. If it's anything, it's not perfect. You see, perfect only comes in the hereafter. Right? It's messy. And yet His grace does so much thing. Ask yourself about our church, a church you've been to, if you're visiting the church you go. Ask yourself this in general about church. Is it a place where people can come in and say, look, I'm addicted to meth. i got to have some help. Because that, that's fixing to be messy, right? Is your church a place that says, I can't handle my finances. I've got to go bankrupt. What can I do? Can I find some kind of help here? I'm struggling with porn. Is this a place to find help? My marriage is falling apart. Can I find help here? I think I might be gay. Is this a place? Is this a church? Is your church a church where that kind of thing can be talked about? See, the church should be the first place one goes to handle these kinds of problems, messy problems that we all have. Church is a place for dealing with messy lives because it offers healing and it offers growth. You see, this thing of showing and being full of grace and truth, like Jesus came, he was full of what? Grace and truth. And us doing the same, that means it's going to be messy as we show them the perfection of Christ and what he wants us to be in Christ. Messy grace. In Luke chapter 15, Jesus is fixing to talk to a bunch of folks. He's going to tell them these great stories of the lost was found and, and the coin and the sheep and the prodigal son. And we had to celebrate, had to play music, had to dance because a, what was lost is now found. But before he ever tells those, he identifies the people he's talking to in Luke chapter 15. He says this. Now, the tax collectors, my boy, they're some messy folks. They had some problems because they collect a little on the side for themselves. They weren't the most respected people in the community. But they're there. And sinners. Well, that pretty well gets everybody else is in a mess, right? They're all gathered around to hear him. Now, here's some other folks there. But the Pharisees, there's your religious folks and teachers of the law. They're over on the side. They're there, and they're muttering. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. They say it like it's a bad thing. I'm saying if that's said of our church, it's a good thing. If someone says about there, oh, that church down there, oh man, they're full of a bunch of they're full of a bunch of addicts and immoral people. I mean, that's just a bunch of mess down there. Amen to that. Because that's the audience Jesus is fixing to tell this story to. You remember in uh, Luke 18, the prayer of the Pharisee and the prayer of the tax collector. And one was like, oh, Lord, thank you, you didn't make me like that. Prideful, arrogant. Yet the humility 
came from the tax collector. And if I remember right, the Bible says God gives grace to the humble. And he resists the proud. Grace is it's pretty messy. Start digging into people's lives. Start digging into our lives. Because we all have this kind of mess. That if we're fortunate enough, we can find the Lord. And as we grow, he can turn our mess into a message. And he gets the glory for it. We get to grow up as well as have the assurance of being with him forever. Grace is a pretty good deal. Amen to that. Well, what does grace say? First of all, grace says that you begin again. Remember in John 8, they bring this woman. She's caught in adultery. It's early in the morning, John 8 says, it's at dawn. And Jesus is gathered there at the temple courts, and he's got a Bible class going on. And those people are all sitting there, and they're listening to Jesus talk. And the Pharisees bring in this woman caught in adultery and bring her right into the middle of this Bible class. You think you've had yours interrupted. Man, think about this. And they throw her out in the middle and say, Jesus, the law says stone her. What do you think we ought to do? Of course, they already had the rocks in their hands. But they really didn't care about the woman. See, they're saying that the Bible says to trap him. The fact is, they didn't care about the mess she was in. They didn't care about her shame. They didn't care about her sin. They didn't care about her salvation. They just wanted to trap the Savior. All the other people in the Bible class, that they're sitting there watching. The eyes are this big. Matter of fact, I bet later on that day when they left and they met somebody that normally comes, they said, man, you should have been in Bible class today. <laughs> wow. They probably all showed up the next day. And Jesus bends on the ground and he writes something in the sand. And he says, I'll tell you why. Anybody in here doesn't have a mess. All of you, you have no, the one that doesn't have any sin, you go ahead and throw the first stone. And you can hear him hit the ground. Boom, 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 boom. And they're dropped. And they go away. And Jesus asked the woman, well, where are your accusers at? Well, they're not here. i tell you what. You go on and leave your life of, of sin. That woman, I love how the God used religious legalists in the Pharisees to bring a woman to Jesus who found grace. You got to like that, you know? Messy? Oh, but she got to begin again. Then John 4, remember the woman at the well? Jesus meets her, not even supposed to be talking to this Samaritan woman. He, after all, he's a priest, he's a teacher. And, and, and there they begin this conversation. He starts, he starts uh, talking to her about living water. And she's like, tell me about this living water, you know. And so all of a sudden when he challenges her life, remember, uh, he said, go, hey, go get your husband and bring him back. And she says, uh, I don't have a husband. He said, boy, you're right about that. Matter of fact, you've had five, and the guy you're living with now is not your husband. A mess? She's in a mess. She's made five commitments she couldn't keep, and now is just living with a guy. You have people coming to your church that are in the middle of living with each other or people whose marriages are messed up or people who had all kinds of problems. That's a mess. Where do they need to be? Right here in our pews. We're here. This is where we want people to be. And Jesus tells her about who he is and this living water and she can drink and she goes back and by the way brings a whole town and a whole community of people to come back and see who Jesus is and to find out. And she learns how to begin again. And by the way, Jesus didn't tell her to go fix everything. Well, you got to go back to your first husband. And you really wasn't married to the second or the third one. And th no. no. We messed that up so bad. No, you just come in the mess you're in. 
and grace is enough. Start where you are. Live for God. Grace says you begin again. Grace says something else too. Grace says you belong. Remember in Luke chapter 15 that the prodigal son is gone. And he's, he said, man, if I can just get back to, he finally comes to his senses. If I can just get back to my father's place. Maybe just as a servant, that'd be okay. And he goes home and the whole time, the whole time the father is looking for him. And when he sees him from a distance, he runs to him. I love that. God runs to us. And takes him and says, Lord, you're, you're put the robe on him. Put the crown on him. Let's break out, the, 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 break out all the party stuff. We're fixing to have a big celebration here. We're going to have a big meal. And all they're celebrating because the son that was dead is now alive. He's lost but now found. That's great grace. Not only that, he says, the father's saying, you're in my family again. You belong here. You belong. And every one of us have inside of us that need to belong. That need to be a part. That need to be in a family. More than just our physical family. The family of God. You see, God created us like this. You see, we belong not only to God, but we belong to church or to family. Matter of fact, let let me just correct something that I hear from time to time out there in people's lives. Well, Mike, I don't really need to go to church. I can just worship God in my house. Well, the Greek word for that is hogwash. <laughs> you don't find that in the Bible anywhere. We need each other. Matter of fact, God, at the very creation, everything, everything's growing, everything's made, and all of a sudden, it's still not good because man's alone. He needs a connection. But not only that, he needs a connection with a family, with a nation that's going to be born, that's going to bring about joy to the world when Christmas comes. And the family that we're a part of called the church is vital to our lives. You show me someone that quits going to the assembly and I'll show you someone that's dying on the vine before long because you cannot have distance between God's people and survive. You need to be in the assembly. There's a reason Hebrew writer says, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as some are in the habit of doing because when you get that habit going on, it always hurts you. And do not make this old art. Well, Mike, they met in churches in the New Testament. Yeah, because their persecution. They were also meeting in temple courts. Look, Jesus always worked two ways. Notice this. He always worked in a crowd. He would go and he taught just like in Luke 5. He's teaching in the, uh, the Sermon on the Mount. And it's a crowd. He drew a crowd. We need a crowd. The crowd brings inspiration the songs, the encouraging, the handshakes, the hugging. We need each other. You need the crowd. You need the assembly. He taught. He inspired in the crowd. He trained in the group. He took his 12 disciples and he trained them and he taught them and they multiplied that thing out. So you always have a need for both things to take place. You need the crowd, you need an assembly to get inspired and uplifted. But you need a group to be trained and to grow. And, and you live one without the other and you're going to be in trouble. So what, look, that's what's so great about Celebrate Recovery and Reengage. They got it. Whether they knew it or not, they got it. Because you got both things happening at the same time on the same night. You come in, first of all, with a, a, a testimony or a teaching. You have celebration. You have worship. And it's great. And then you break off and you go into those groups. And you get trained and you grow. And how valuable, guys, are the step studies and the discipleship groups? How valuable are they to your growth? You need them both. You belong to a church. I need you here. I need to see your smile. I need to shake your hand. I need to be encouraged by you offer something to the body. That ain't something you can do at the house by yourself. 
All right, let me move on. I get to preaching a whole lot about that. The other thing is, grace says you behave. You know, this was an interesting verse over in Titus. Turn over there with me. In Titus, in chapter 2, in verse 11, he says something about grace here. I, I didn't notice this for a long time. I always thought fear is what kept people in line. Punishment's what kept people in line. Worked pretty good at my house with my dad <laughs> for a while. Till you grow and get out on your own. You see, he says in this chapter, Titus 2, verse 11, he says, For the grace of God that brings salvation, it initially, it, it's, it's the only way in. You're saved by grace. It brings salvation, has appeared to all men. Now, here's what it does. It teaches us. Grace does? Look what grace does. Grace teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to self-control uh, upright and, uh, to, and to live self-controlled upright and godly lives in this present age. Grace teaches us how to behave. That's what grace teaches. And if you get, try to get someone to try to behave using the word of God, truth, even using truth, you try to get them to behave, but you have no grace, it will not work and will not last. We've tried that for years. Jesus came full of grace and truth. We need them both. Grace teaches us how to behave godly. He says, he says to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and purify himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Grace says you behave. You be godly, you do good. That's what happens. That's the result of a grace-filled life. We act godly, and we do good. There's always that gap, though, isn't it, between who we want to be and who we are? But fear won't push and fill that gap. That's a growing in God's grace. And as we learn to appreciate more and more the story of the death, burial, and resurrection, then we become more and more like Jesus. And the more like Jesus we are, the better we are at being salt and light in a world that needs it so desperately because you see the mess doesn't go away when you become a Christian you have forgiveness but guess what how many of you are like me that even after years of being in Christ you still get yourself into messes sometimes and probably the biggest one is starts even in our own minds you know we need to take advice from God you know who talks to you more than anybody else you do yourself and if you listen to yourself and you alone you don't end up in a good place see people who isolate themselves from other people and isolate themselves from God and they only talk to themselves are people who can rationalize in their mind and their own need and their own lies that Satan fills them with can strap a bomb on and go down and blow themselves up in the middle of a group of people. What's the thing you always hear about this kind of stuff? Well, he was a loner. He did this. He did. Look, we don't give ourselves very good advice. We need to say out loud what God says about us to help frame in our minds 
what God thinks about us because we tend to hang on to the mess in our conversations. When God's forgiven them a long time ago, we hang on to the shame of an event God forgave years ago. We hang on to the guilt that God forgave years ago. And yet we have that conversation over and over again, and Satan takes advantage of it. And the next thing you know, we're so down and self-pity that we make ourselves useless for the kingdom. Don't give in to believing everything you tell yourself. Believe what God says about you and do good. Remember that Good Samaritan story? That guy that came by him, he, I, hey, look, he found him in a mess. Other people, religious people, avoided the mess. But thank goodness for those Good Samaritans that aren't afraid to get their hands dirty in the life of somebody else and bring grace to the mess that somebody's in. Well, the other thing grace says is grace says you become his. You become his and you stay his. See, in Romans 8, he says something about the law. He says the law of Christ, is, we've been set free from the law of works, from the law of sin. We've been set free from that. That law says every time I sin, I die, and i got to ask God for forgiveness again because I'm dead, and, and now i got to get alive, and I'm dead, and I'm alive. And I, that's a law of sin, that every time you sin, you die. We're under the law of grace. We don't die every time we sin. We're walking, we're learning, we're growing. And God through Jesus Christ's blood, 1 John 1 said, continually cleanses our sin as we're walking in the light. So even in the light we have sin, it's just being taken care of all the time. So that's what grace does. That's the great thing about it. That's how come we can have assurance of eternal life, not based on what we do, but based on what He did for us. Not only did He forgive our past sins, present sins, and He knows everyone will commit in the future. And yet, his grace is enough, Paul said. Amen to that. His grace is enough. We are his. We're his children. We belong to the Father. Nobody can snatch us out of his hands. We belong to God. And he says that makes us his. And when you're his, that means you are sons and daughters of the creator of the universe. You are heirs and co-heirs with Christ. You are royalty. You are more than conquerors. You are overcomers. You are victorious. You are light. You are salt. You are courageous. You are grace-saved, spirit-led, hope-filled, heaven-bound, children of the Almighty King. Amen. That's who you are. You're His. Enjoy being His. But that's why He gave you grace. You see that father that welcomed that prodigal son? Oh, don't you think he enjoyed the son being his? Grace embraces us with all of our messes and turns them into a message that impacts other people that we get to be around in this old world. And I praise God that I have mercy and that I have messy grace. Because I need it, don't you? That's what's great about the gospel. When a person puts their hope in the death, bone, resurrection of Jesus, they're baptized into Christ. They start all over. You begin again. You become a child of God. You learn how to behave differently. 
You belong to the Almighty. Now you tell me, is there anything greater to belong to than the church of Christ that Jesus died for? He's the, he's the bride. The church is the bride. He's the bridegroom. What a great day when he comes again. But between the angel singing at his birth and the angel blowing the trumpet at his second Christmas when he comes again, between that we're going to praise him and serve him and we're looking forward to that final Christmas coming. And boy, won't that be a day. You can have in on this if you want to become God's child at the invitation today. If you've just gotten yourself in a mess and you just need the brothers and sisters praying for you, that's our family time together down here too. Whatever needs you have, make that known while together we stand and we sing this song.